very warm welcome to this Burton commemoration service, which we know as the Burton service. Welcome too to those of you who are joining through the live stream in schools or perhaps watching from home. This traditional service of Thanksgiving plays a vital part in the history of our schools and is one of the many ways in which we, as the current generation of pupils and staff across the foundation, continue to connect with those who have gone before us. Later, we will sing of these enduring bonds in the words of G.W. Briggs' hymn, Our Father by Whose Servant, as we remember that as we belong here, and now to Loughborough Schools Foundation, we belong to one family unbroken. Each year in this service, we bring our own lives, the lives of our schools and the life of our foundation before God. As we do so, we remember the background of faith and long-standing commitment to serving the community, which are still fundamental to the life of our schools. A couple of important notices before we begin. Firstly, please make sure you have turned off any mobile devices completely to eliminate interruptions and reduce the potential for the Wi-Fi dropping. Secondly, please just make yourselves aware of the fire exits as we gather. If we have to leave church, we will leave through the doors, either of the doors at the back or the door at the front and gather on the parish green. We're very privileged today to have Bishop Sadhu with us, Bishop of Loughborough, and we look forward to hearing you speak later, Bishop Sadhu. Our service follows the pattern of liturgy established in use for many years in our schools. I invite you to join in singing the hymns and in saying the words in bold type. We begin now with a moment of silence before we say the opening responses that are printed in your service booklet or which will appear on the screen. After these responses, we will remain standing to sing our first hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer. Then the service will continue unannounced. So please stand now for a moment of stillness. We come in this service to God, in our need and bringing with us the needs of the world. We come with our faith and our doubts. We come with our hopes and our fears. We come as we are it is because it is God who invites us to come. And God has promised never to turn us away.
as we give thanks for our founders and benefactors. Let us pray. Lord God, you have taught us that we are members of one another. We thank you for the community of which we are a part. For Charles, our King. For those who represent us in Parliament. For those who serve in places of influence and authority in our town of Loughborough. For those who guide and govern our schools. And for all that these schools have given to us. On this day especially, we give you thanks for all who have given of their wealth or their service to the founding, building and maintenance of our schools. And especially today, we remember our benefactor, Thomas Burton. Help us, like him, to offer ourselves in the service of others. Amen. Psalm 84, verses 1 to 12. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baker, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favour and honour. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you.
1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 21. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. For God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love, he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters, are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also.
Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So the father divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his eldest son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you, and I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we have to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Charles Dickens called that story the greatest story ever told. C.S. Lewis asked of that story, said, it contains Christianity's greatest idea. When I was 15 years old, I was growing up in the city of Bangalore in South India. I discovered that idea, and today I want to share that particular idea of grace with you. And perhaps it's a fair question for us to ask, what is so amazing about grace that we have to sing about it, that we have to speak about it? What is so magnificent about grace? I'm not sure what your story is, but every one of us, we wrestle with questions, questions of identity, purpose, destiny, and meaning. Who are we? What is our purpose? Why do we exist? What happens when we die? And these are existential questions that so many of us ask at different stages in our lives. And today, as I present this great idea to you, I want you to consider. Today, you might not think it's a good idea, but I want to assure you, perhaps one day, you might look back into this day and think that idea might be useful. So what is this idea? Embedded with that story is the story that we all know. It's very familiar. Let me walk through it once again. 
It's a story of a man who has two sons. The younger one says to the father, Father, I want my share of the estate. In the context in which it, it was written, it literally means, Father, I wish you were dead. In Syria, in Lebanon, in any part of the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, in India, wherever you read that text, it means one thing. Father, I wish you are dead. You are still breathing. I want my share of the estate. So this young son takes this share of the estate and he squanders his property on wild living. And then when he lost all his property, he makes his way back home only with the thought, ah, my father is a rich man. Even the servants in his house are having a fantastic meal. And here I am in a pigsty. I want to make my way back. So he makes his way back home. And in the story, we have this magnificent scene. The scene is of the father running as he sees the young son making his way back home. And therefore, I ask, why? Why does the father run? Well, you might think the answer is very obvious. Of course, he is delighted to see his son. But there is another reason. And I want you to listen carefully because this reason takes you to the heart of Christianity's greatest idea. In the first century, the context in which the story was written, there was a ceremony in the first century, and the ceremony was called Keziah Ceremony. It is a Jewish ceremony, and many scholars have written about Keziah Ceremony. A Keziah Ceremony is a ceremony whereby when the son if he has the audacity to make his way back, having squandered his property, the community would commit a, a, a ceremony. And the ceremony is called Keziah. Do you know what a Keziah ceremony is? A Keziah ceremony is simply this. The community would gather at the edge of the village. And they would take an earthen pot. And they would break this pot in the heart of the community. You know why? as a way of telling people, this is what you have done to the Father's heart. Now you see why the Father runs. The Father runs to get to the edge of the village before the village comes and gets this young man. The Father was saving the life of the Son. That is amazing grace. The Christian idea of amazing grace simply says, we are not what we think we are. It's the idea that says, we are not what we feel we are. We are not what other people think we are. We are not the definitions other people have given about us. We are loved by God. I thought the way our choir sang that song, Oh Love, was beautiful. And the words of the song was, it's a love that does not let you go. That's the heart of Christianity. Even though we are flawed like the sun, we are unconditionally loved by God. It's an idea I picked up when I was 15 years old. And sometimes I have been unfaithful to the idea. But God has never let me down. So therefore, as we seek questions around our identity, around who we are, may I remind you, the heart of Christianity is not just who you are, it's also whose you are. God loves you. God's heart is for everyone. It's unconditional. That is amazing. That's why it's amazing grace.
Let us thank God for all his gifts to us and let us pray for ourselves and for the needs of others. We thank you, Lord God, for all that we have gained through education, for new knowledge, new skills, new experiences and new insights. Help us, we pray, to continue to learn all through our lives. Give us the determination never to be content with less than our best. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of friendship, and especially for those people who have shared our troubles and supported us when life is hard. Help us to value our friends and to regard each one as a token of your love. Make us ready to extend friendship to others around us and to remember the lonely, the sick, the bereaved, and all in need. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, look with love on our world and heal the sorrows and suffering of humankind. Save the nations from the desire for power, from racial hatred, jealousy, and worship of material things. And grant that in every land of all people may live to serve you in peace and freedom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Living God, we pray for all who are any way troubled at this time, and especially those known to us. Give relief to those in pain, friendship to those who are alone, reassurance to those who are in doubt or distress of mind. Lord, in your mercy. Open our eyes, Lord, that we may see the deepest needs of others. Move our hands that they may feed the hungry. Touch our hearts that they may bring warmth to the despairing and teach us the generosity that welcomes strangers. Lord, in your mercy. We join all these prayers together in the words of the Lord's Prayer as we pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen.
us the past to your mercy, the present to your love, and the future to your wisdom. Amen. Words of blessing. May you who are restless find rest and in rest restoration. May you who are frozen find freedom and in freedom the strength to face the fire. May you who are conflicted find convergence and in convergence the confidence to live this day. May you live in tension, find tenderness, and the tendency to grace. May you who are alone, may you find grace and grow into fruitfulness. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>